Well, good morning. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, people online. Hello. Um, good morning. Thank you for that great good morning. I love that. Um, I welcome you guys to stand as we're just going to start to sing. A thousand generations falling down in worship. Sing the song of ages to the land. All who come before us, and all who will believe, will sing the song of ages to the land. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all paths and positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry, holy, all creation cries, holy, you are living. God, thank you so much that we are here, God, together, worshiping a loving God who is alive, who's active in our lives. God, we come before you today just in a place of thanksgiving and knowing that you are good. Um, sometimes it doesn't feel like things are good, God, but you are always good. And Father, bless you, God. 
We love you. Hear our hearts' cries as we worship, as we actively worship from the bottom of our hearts. The song is just to you. So thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to keep singing here. Um, this is a new one. We've tried it with our youth group, so um, it involves clapping. Are you guys ready for clapping? <laughs> Can you clap at that? One. There we go. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry.
Though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove there's nothing you can't do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, remain staying fast. And then my heart, when you speak the word, come to pass. Great is your Put my faith in Jesus. pray in a second here and we're gonna pray for in a second here and dismiss our kids um but before that i'm just gonna list off a few of our prayer requests um that are that we can be praying for and feel free to be praying for these during the week too these are some of the things that come through our like our email prayer list and whatnot as well and one is for um for for d and sean as um d is preparing for heart surgery on may 7th um 
Those battling cancer, Bonnie Ferguson, Fess, uh, Kim Marchand's brother Wayne, Jessica, Patrick. Um, our, our prayer for Kirk as he grieves and works through the loss of his mom, Norma. Prayer for Frank Woodford as he, can, as he prepares for surgery at the end of the month. And we're going to be praying for all this stuff. And the way that God's working in our church, in our community, and, with our, and we're going to pray for our kids as well with all these things. So let's join together as we pray this morning. Oh, God. Um, you see it all, God. You know it all. And God, we don't need the fancy prayer to ask you for, for these things, God. We just want you to see our hearts in this, these matters, God, that it, God, we care and we know you care. And God, we ask for your help in this stuff, God, for healing, for protection, for peace, God, on so many people who are dealing with so many different things, God. And um, we're only human, God, and sometimes we worry. And God, I just pray that you you be with us, God, as we, um, even for the things that aren't mentioned on this list, God. God, you are there. You're with us, God. And God, I pray that you remind us of that. And God, that your Holy Spirit will work all through all these things, God. Father, thank you for community. Thank you for the fact that we have um, this where we can come together and ask for things from you, God, and seek your face. So Father, help us to continue to do that as we engage in the community around us, God. And Father, we pray for our kids that as they go this morning and they learn and they seek you, um, God, that it will be something just super meaningful for them, God. Something that is, um, that's going to go deep down into their heart, God. So thank you. Thank you for the, the people who um, are doing the youth and the kids stuff this morning. And pray you, you speak through them too. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, okay, youth, you guys are at the portable with Letitia. Kids, if you're grade five or down, you're going downstairs. You're with Ange and Jill. Have fun. Thanks to uh, Brent and Jules for leading us with the music this morning. You know, as Brent was going through those prayer requests, I was... Uh, Reminded of a, a simple little book by the author Anne Lamott talking about prayer, and it was called Help, Thanks, Wow. And those basically says that sums up all of our prayers. Help, thanks, and wow. And if we could uh, just spend some time thinking through those things, it might help us as we, as we pray. Um, just a couple of reminders that I want to fire through before we get into the message this morning. Um, First of all, if you are new among us, if you're visiting, we're especially glad to have you here. Whether you're online or here in person, um, we have a form that you can fill out. Just let us know some stuff about you, give you a chance to sign up for email lists or, or ask any questions. Um, so there's a card if you're here in person. Um, there's a QR code on something that looks like this that you can scan it and fill it out electronically. Or for those online, there's a link in the YouTube description if you're interested in filling that out. We do have a newcomer's lunch today, right after the service. The uh, deacons have prepared a bunch of food that's downstairs for us. Um, actually, we sh we, I thought maybe we should call it not just newcomer's lunch because like, they happen once in a while. And, and sometimes people have missed some in the past. They haven't been able to attend. Other people maybe have been at Covenant, you know, a long time ago and are coming back and, and are just kind of getting reoriented. And so it's, it's open for all of those who are, are looking to kind of reconnect or connect or just have questions about stuff that's going on. So there are some extra spots for those who are here and maybe haven't planned lunch and want to stick around. Um, so that's immediately after the service. A couple other things that are coming up. Uh, youth this week is off-site. They're doing a bonfire. And so a permission form has to be filled out. So if you have any students that want to participate, they can go on to our website or, or find a link on the uh, Covenant Youth social media pages. But that has to be filled out to participate. Uh, Earth Week is coming up. And as a part of that, we're doing our road cleanup out in Tiny Township. We're basically Lafontaine Road from uh, that SO station to 
that SO station. Um, uh, we, we, we are responsible for cleaning that up. And so you can talk to Elise if you're interested in participating, get your gloves and vests and bags and, and be able to coordinate you know, a section of that road that, that you could go for a nice walk at any point during that week and, uh, and do some cleanup. We'd love to have lots of helpers for that. It's a win-win. You get to clean up, you get exercise, and you get to honor Earth Week. It's like everybody wins. Um, what else do we have? Coffee and conversation meeting April 28th after the service, so two weeks from now. Um, Brent did ask me to mention that for Inspire, we had a meeting last week, and, and it's looking really great again this year. The big thing we need right now is some more adult leaders to lead some crews. That's, that's, a, that's a bit of a worry for, for us. Um, some of those who have been key leaders for us in the past just aren't able to this year. And so we do need some more adult leaders. If you're, if you're interested, if you have any questions about what that might look like, then please talk to Brent. Um, and then I do want to mention again, Kakwa has several retreats coming up. And if you're interested in uh, participating in the fall retreats for, there's a 50 plus retreat, kind of an active retreat. And then there's uh, two seniors retreats. The registration opens on May 1st and they tend to fill up fairly quickly. So just want to mention that so you can be planning in your calendar if you want to participate in those things. Let me pray and then we will jump into uh, our sermon and a new series this week. God, thank you. Thank you that you are present with us here and that you are not bound up by this building, that whether people are online or in person or, or watching later this week, that, that you are with each of us and with all of us. God, I ask that as we work through this series, you would help us to understand just a little bit more of the world we find ourselves in, the situation we find ourselves in, and, and the, the invitation and challenge for how we can and should live in it, sharing and showing the, and enjoying the love of Jesus. God, thank you again for your presence among us. Open us up to hear from you during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're launching into a new series uh, today, and it's not going to be like a straight number of weeks. We're doing a few weeks, and then there'll be some weeks off, and then we'll get back to it, and then maybe a week off, and then get back to it, and it'll take us till close to the, the summer. Uh, but we're calling it Exiles. Um, we, and it's really a study in the book of Daniel. We try and do series from different parts of the Bible. And so this is going back into the Old Testament. And I mean, those who have read Daniel, it's just some of the craziest, coolest stories. Um, you know, if, if you grew up going to Sunday school, these are probably some of the stories you remember. And so we're going to lean into it. Um, before we actually get into the story, let me give you a bit of a context. Um, the context for the book of Daniel is something called exile, so specifically the, the exile of the Hebrew people or the Israelite people. Um, to, make, to give you the context very briefly, uh, Israel had been divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdoms, many years ago, which was many years before the events of the book. Um, it had already been kind of conquered and destroyed. That was the nation that was actually called Israel in the time. The southern kingdom, Judah, which is where Jerusalem was, which is kind of the heart of Hebrew worship, that stuck around for a lot longer. But in 597, Babylon, the kingdom of Babylon, invaded Jerusalem. Um, they had tried to get help from somewhere else, and then they picked the wrong side, so to speak. And so Babylon came in and destroyed Jerusalem. To start with, about 10,000 people from Jerusalem were taken as exiles, taken from Jerusalem to live in Babylon. That number would grow to up to about 20,000 people during the time that Babylon was, was kind of over, over Jerusalem. And at the time, there was maybe 75,000 people that were living in Jerusalem. We're talking about a huge percentage of the population was taken from Jerusalem up to Babylon, uh, you know, around 15% of the population. At the time, Babylon had about 200,000 people in it. It was the largest city known in the world at the time. It was the hub of the largest empire in the West at the time. It was the home of uh, academics and arts and worship and power. It was, it was the center of civilization. And so you had these 
you know, 10,000 uh, Jewish people, these Hebrew people that were taken from their home and, and dropped in there. And it wasn't just any random 10,000 people that they took. It was the, the people who predominantly shaped and governed things in Israel. It was the people who were the royalty, the nobility, the scholars, the priests. It was the people who kind of made Jewish culture that were taken. And so for the Hebrew people, although it wasn't all of the people that were taken, this time period is considered the exile because such influential and significant numbers of people were taken into exile to another land, another place. And the capital was, was basically, like the, the walls were leveled and it was non-existent and non-functioning during this time. For all intents and purposes, there was no Israel as a nation at this point. Um, the reason for the exile was, uh, was really, the reason given in Scripture is idolatry, idolatry and rebellion. Um, now, just to be clear, idolatry wasn't that they stopped worshiping Yahweh. It was that they worshiped Yahweh, oh yeah, and all of these other gods too. It was this, this, this syncretism, this, this mixing of things, and, and, and Yahweh was no longer the Lord. They were trying to mix it with other things. And rebellion, at its heart, wasn't the worship piece. It was forgetting about the justice that God desired. Isaiah 29 talks about why people were going to be, why Israel and Judah were going to be getting uh, conquered and it says this it says the lord says these people say they are mine they honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me so they're engaged in worship they say we're god's people but their hearts aren't there it says and their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules learned by rote that's challenging because they were doing some of the sacrifices that god had told them to do, and yet God says that there's man-made rules learned by rote. Because of this, I will once again astound these hypocrites with amazing wonders. The wisdom of the wise will pass away, and the intelligence of the intelligent will disappear. And then get this, the scoffer will be gone, the arrogant will disappear, and those who plot evil will be killed. Those who convict the innocent by their false testimony will disappear. A similar fate awaits those who use trickery to pervert justice and who tell lies to destroy the innocent. People were doing the religious stuff, but using it and twisting it, manipulating it for their own advantage and for the oppression of others. And in light of this, they were, they were losing, they, they were no longer being the blessing to the world and to each other that they were supposed to be. And that is the reason given for this exile, this defeat that they faced. It's... You see this over and over again in Scripture, that, that God gives people over to the thing that they embrace. So if you want to embrace violence and aggression and, 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 and power over people, then you'll get given over to violence and oppression and someone having power over you. This is what plays out in this story. So imagine yourself. You're a part of this nation I suspect that many people who were a part of that nation kind of were ignorant as to what God was actually calling them to because the people who were setting the tone for, for everything had given themselves over to it. And then they were just telling you, this is the way it's supposed to be, everybody. But they still are a part of this group that is given into exile, taken from their home, the place that they'd belonged to, this place where they'd been for so many years. What was that like for them? Well, there's a psalm, Psalm 127, sorry, 137, that gives us a taste of what this was like for them. If you have not read many of the psalms and you think all of the psalms are happy worship psalms, uh, this is a pretty raw glimpse as to what it was like for people who had been conquered and taken away from their home. Psalm 137 Beside the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept as we thought of Jerusalem. We put away our harps, hanging them on the branches of poplar trees. For our captors demanded a song from us. Our tormentors insisted on a joyful hymn. Sing us one of those songs of Jerusalem. 
But how can we sing the songs of the Lord well in a pagan land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget how to play the harp. May my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I fail to remember you, if I don't make Jerusalem my greatest joy. O Lord, remember what the Edomites did on the day the armies of Babylon captured Jerusalem. Destroy it, they yelled. Level it to the ground. O Babylon, you will be destroyed. Happy is the one who pays you back for what you have done to us. Happy is the one who takes your babies and smashes them against the rocks. Yeah, ew. It was supposed to feel that. That's what they felt. That was the level of horror and destruction that they faced. And now they're sitting there in that land with people mocking them and tormenting them with that kind of pain. How are they supposed to live in that world? It's that context that we get the stories from the book of Daniel. It's that context kind of tension and pain and, and, and place that the stories that we're going to read over the next number of weeks take place. So what's the purpose of these stories? The purpose of the stories are not just to tell the stories. It's not to give events. In fact, there are many who think these, these stories were written much later, actually well after the exile. There's lots of scholarly debates as to how close to the exile they were written but, but as best we can tell, many of them were at least edited much later. And they're written not to record the events. They're written to encourage people who are coming later and living in a kind of exile of their own. Their purpose lies beyond the events of this time. Um, a couple of uh, scholars that I, I was reading through this week put it this way. Uh, Tremper Longman III, who just sounds smart when you have a name like that. Um, but he said, when Daniel's original audience read the book, they were given a new vista on their situation and their God. The goal of Daniel is to, to give them a glimpse, a, a, a different kind of way to think about their own reality and where God is in their own space. Um, John Golden Gay uh, wrote, that these stories portray an alternative world before their listeners' ears and ask whether they are prepared to risk living in their alternative world. So both of them, one, one is giving a new vista, one says there's an alternative thing. There's the narrative that is the standard one, that, that, that the, the kingdom that we're living in wants to tell us, but then this suggests that there's, for exiles, an alternative reality that we need to be aware of as we try and make our way in the world. For God's people, living in a world that's not their true home, for exiles in any era, Daniel, this book, invites us to look beyond the current reality, to live faithfully despite the challenges, and to courageously embody God's kingdom with both a bold trust and a willingness to lose it all rather than compromise. Christians are and have always meant, they've always been meant to be exiles in the world as it is. Um, Jesus talked a lot about the kingdom of heaven. Paul talked about us being citizens of heaven, that we have this citizenship somewhere else, but we're living here now. And for, in a very real sense, Christians are supposed to be living as exiles. Now, this can be really hard for Christians in the West to grasp because for many centuries, really since like 300 AD, we've had the power. Christians have had the power, had the control, and it's left us, it's left many with the illusion that this world as it currently operates is our home and it's the place as it's operating that God wants it to be. You know, the church has had power. The church could set the agenda. Our governments, by and large, used religious language to talk about why and how it did what it did. This time that existed really starting with Constantine in 300 AD, this time of, of church power is referred to as Christendom, 
this time when, when the, the church was the one that was in control. And in Christendom, the broad assumption has been that because the church had power, most of how things operated, whether it was nationhood or economics or religious structures or education, it was at its core influenced by Christianity and therefore was good. And yes, if you look back, you can see how we've learned and we've grown and we can look back and say, well, that wasn't ideal, but we've learned. We're not like that anymore. And, and so we can, we can see things that weren't as good in the past, but we tend to think, but we're okay now. Within the framework of Christendom, with Christian influence as the assumed positive reality, most Christians went along with the structures and the ways of thinking that existed in our world. we perhaps didn't even realize how much the way of Jesus was being lost to other idols. We were meant to be exiles, but by and large, the church has simply adopted the ways and practices of the kingdom of the world as our own and then called them Christian. We, didn't, we haven't lived as exiles. I will say there have been Glimpses and pockets as you look through history of people who kind of said, wait a second, this doesn't look like Jesus. And they've, they've tried to live as exiles within this, this power thing, but it was especially challenging when everyone else was using Christian language too. In recent decades, the church has increasingly lost its power. There's debates as to whether or not Christendom is officially over or not, but the church has lost its power increasingly in the West. The assumptions that we previously made about things are now being rejected. And so many Christians are now feeling like exiles for the first time. I mean, the world has changed in my lifetime in terms of how people perceive the church. And some of you are at least a couple of years older than me, and you can speak to like, hey, things are different now for people in the church than it was 50, 60, 70 years ago. And it, we can feel like exiles. As Christendom dies, the church as a whole sometimes doesn't quite know what to do. And there's a diversity of perspective, of responses to this, this shifting reality. One is for people to reject anything and everything that um, sounds Christian. You know, Christendom is done, so we're just going to leave all of that behind, often rejecting Jesus in the process. Uh, another way is for people just to pretend that it isn't dead or dying, and just, no, no, everything's the way it, it, it always has been, and just kind of proverbially, proverbially put our head in the sand, or like close our ears and close our eyes and pretend that things aren't changing. A third way that people respond to the shifting is to start fights, to try and hold on to Christendom, to hold on. It's like, wait, they're, they're, they, whoever they are, they're taking this from us and we need to fight them to, to get it back. That type of response. None of those kinds of responses acknowledge the deepest reality that we've always been meant to live as exiles. Recognizing that there's a deeper reality that we are a part of here than what the main narrative is. Do you ever have any moments, days, weeks, maybe years, of feeling at odds with the prevailing culture or, or with the way things are thought about or done in the world? You know, maybe you struggle to see you know, you, you want to follow Jesus, but then there's these expectations your family puts on you, and you feel at odds with it as you try and follow Jesus. Maybe you struggle to reconcile, you know, business practices that are taking place in the workplace and, you know, the justice concerns that are talked about by Jesus. Maybe you want to live out the love of Jesus, but you feel uncomfortably drawn into the way people speak about others at school, on the field, or on social media feeds. Maybe it's just a sense that the things that are increasingly important to you just don't seem to be the things that are important to anyone or, or very few people around you. 
And maybe that leads you sometimes to wondering, okay, what's, what's wrong with me? Being at odds with, I want to be clear, being at odds with the world around us doesn't guarantee that we are properly living from a place of exile. Sometimes we're just out to lunch. <laughs> but if we are truly embracing our primary citizenship in this kingdom of heaven with Jesus as Lord, we will find ourselves on the outside of things in settings where he is not treated as such. And dare I say, this includes religious settings, church settings, where things other than Jesus are held up as the most important things. Embracing our reality as exiles frees us to move beyond questions of power or trying to figure out what's wrong in the world. And it invites us to say, okay, we're exiles here. Now, Let's go on a journey of figuring out how to live as citizens of that ultimate home within the context we find ourselves. With that in mind, we're going to go really quickly through Daniel chapter 1 and see how it might prompt our thinking about living as exiles in our context. I'm just going to read 21 verses of, of Daniel chapter 1. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of the Lord. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring, the, to, bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. They're basically drafted to go to the Babylon University for a three-year program where they're going to get Full scholarship, fed, taken care of, pampered, educated. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar, Hananiah was Shadrach, Mishael was Meshach, and Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. This was, they, they, they were not supposed to eat food that had been offered to other idols. And so he's, he's wanting to stay, to stay true to his, uh, his Hebrew faith. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I'm afraid my lord the king who has ordered that you eat this food. Sorry, I'm afraid... Of my, of my lord the king, who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the youths, other youths your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please, test us for ten days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the ten days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. When the, training portion, when the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any manner requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. So very, very quickly, what are some things that are going on in this Daniel's life of exile? Um, just a few, few things that I note here is that the first, they sought to participate in the life 
of the land they're exiled to. They didn't fight it. They didn't balk at, the, the, well, as far as we can read here, they didn't balk at going to this university and being brought into service. They, they went and participated in it. Um, it, it. Another way to put it is they didn't treat it any longer as the enemy. This is where they were now. They had to figure out how are we going to live here. Um, there's an interesting uh, story, uh, passage in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah was a prophet who wrote before the exile. He wrote to them during the exile and then wrote coming out of the exile. But in writing to the same people who sang that psalm that we were horrified at before, Jeremiah told them, he's like, you know, what should you do in this place? Basically, he said, you should build homes, settle down, marry, have kids. You know, God's, this is where Jeremiah 29, that's where you get the, the passage that talks about God have a, having a plan. And it's about for the people as a whole. God's got a plan for, for you. And, and, and he says that, you know, no one can escape the consequences of rejecting God's ways. And that's going to be Babylon too. God's going to bring justice in time. So for now, don't try and push that justice agenda. Like Allow God to bring that when God brings it. You get married, have kids, raise families. And he says, seek the good of the city, for as it thrives, so will you. He's telling people who are in the amount of pain that led to Psalm 137, saying, settle in, be at home, seek the good of the city. It wasn't about making. It wasn't about continuing to see them as enemies. It was. It was trying to thrive and and live God's ways in this world, waiting for God to bring justice in God's time. So they sought to genuinely participate in the life of the land of their exile. Another thing that we see for for Daniel is that as an exile, it it didn't make everything. They were they were in exile, like they were citizens of this other kingdom. They wanted to follow that way, but that didn't make things an all or nothing proposition. It wasn't like everything that was like labeled with Babylon was perceived as evil. Right? They were they were actually coming in to to train, to learn, to to understand. And in the process, God also gave them special insight and wisdom. They were working both with the the wisdom and knowledge and advantages that they could get in Babylon and God's work in their life. I, I think that is a beautiful thing because there is sometimes a tendency to kind of be like, it's got to be all this or none of this. Like we were afraid of anything that, that might smack of worldly wisdom, forgetting that actually anything that's true, anything that is, is in line with the truth of God is, is from God. And we can, we can learn from all kinds of different ways. A couple of really quick examples I thought of, that I, of people that I think do this well today. Um, one is a guy named Francis Collins. Um, some of you may not have heard of him, but you probably saw a lot of, of someone who reported to him during COVID because he was the head of the National Institute of Health uh, in the United States up until 2021. Um, He's a brilliant scientist. He, he founded, or he was the director of the, the Human Genome Institute. He's been a key person in, in seeing things in the human genome that have helped with uh, all kinds of disease treatment. An absolutely brilliant scientist who is also a devout Christian. He has written about belief and science, explaining his reason for faith. Even just this week, he wrote a piece for the Washington Post, which... Many Christians kind of push away as like anything there is, 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 is questionable. But he wrote a piece for the Washington Post in which he celebrated the advancement of cancer treatment and the science related to cancer treatment. And in the same article, he talks about praying and hearing from God uniquely in prayer. Like it's, it's, he, he, he's trying to live in this world as a faithful Christian in exile, recognizing that it's a both and. Uh, another one that uh, Ange isn't here, so probably ne none of you have heard of a guy named Stephen Westerholm. Uh, he is a brilliant thinker and scholar. He's got his doctor in theology. He was a member of the church where I previously pastored. And he could have spent his life like in a, 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 a 
a seminary kind of box where he's working just with Christian people. Um, he didn't, though. He worked in the religious studies department at uh, McMaster University. He's now the professor emeritus of biblical studies at Mac. He sought to faithfully teach and model the way of Jesus in this pluralistic context where some people, because they weren't Christians, questioned, how can someone as smart as you believe this Jesus stuff? And some Christians looked at him and said, how can someone as committed as you work in that environment where not everybody believes the same thing? And, and you're, you're teaching people who are atheist and Muslim, and, and how could you be in that context? He sought to embody his faith with deep humility within the local church and carry what he, he can into, into the world with 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 grace and humility and intellectual integrity. Like Daniel and his friends, they, they, they sought to, 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 to do a both and. Like we're living in the world as faithful Jesus followers. We don't have to throw one out and, and for the sake of the other. We can, we can wrestle with the tension and live with it. And as such, in Daniel, you see, they found a balance of, of working for the good of the kingdom where they lived in while never fully belonging to it. You know, you see, as Daniel and his friends, they have a, a genuine, gracious conversation saying, look, like, we don't think we can go there. Can we propose this alternative? And when they, that alternative for eating gets pushed back, they, can, can we try it? Can we do an experiment? And then you can make a decision. Like, they're, they're genuinely trying to work with people, not against them. And then, ultimately... As they, when they finish, the king is the one who seeks them out because they have this God-given wisdom. And because they're working for the good of the kingdom, they're but rooted in a connection with Yahweh, they're able to maintain a balanced judgment, as it describes here. They don't have the same need to please the king. They actually have an advantage over the people who are just trying to please the king because they... They're like, well, we can say what is actually true and real, not just what the king wants to hear. And the king appreciates that and, and recognizes it. Loyalty to, to God allowed them to serve beyond the loyalty to any earthly king or ruler. Actually, the last verse, it says, Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. That means Daniel stayed in the royal service through multiple kings and actually through, multiple, through different empires. Cyrus was in, from a totally different empire. They came in and they conquered Babylon and said, but we still want you to serve with us because his loyalty was to God first and he was able to serve well for the good of whatever kingdom he found himself in. I need to wrap this up. But I'll just very quickly highlight that exile is really the posture that Jesus took when he came into the world. Michael Frost points this out in his book called Exiles. Jesus came into this world, but it wasn't his ultimate home. But he participated in the life of the land of his exile. Jesus, despite what it might appear, he didn't try and make everything a battle. It was others around him that were insisting that it would be a battle, which is something that Daniel, uh, the stories of Daniel will show happened to them too. Um, Jesus talks about him growing in wisdom and stature, in favor with God and man. It was both human wisdom and God's favor in his life. And then ultimately, Jesus' rest in his Father's affirmation, his connection with the Father, allowed him to teach and love and serve faithfully in the world and for the good of the world without ever fully belonging to the world. So just some questions for you to think about, for us to think about. As we live as people in exile, as we live as citizens of a Jesus-led kingdom within a world that is not a Jesus-led world. First question, at this point in your life, how is God inviting you to participate in the life of our world for the good of our world? What might Jesus be inviting you into to, for the good of our world? The exile life isn't about giving in. It's not about ignoring reality. It's not about making things a battle. It calls on us to live as citizens of the Jesus kingdom and pursue the good of the world that we live in, our neighborhoods, our towns, our cities, our countries, but doing it in a way that is consistent with the Jesus way. Second question, are there ways that you're engaging in this exile life 
with a posture of, of a fight? Are you doing it as a battle in some ways that, that maybe you need to let go of? Maybe it's a battle against some of the religious stuff that has been a part of your life in the past. And so everything that comes up, you want to make it a fight against that. Or a fight against people who, are, who, disagree, who disagree or come with different perspectives on the other side. Are there ways you need to let go of it as a fight so that you can move in with love? Another question, at this point in your life, how might you be led to learn from both human wisdom and divine reliance? My experience is that we sometimes tend to, to be drawn one way or the other. And so is there one way or the other that God might be inviting you into? Um, last question. When we are very aware that things aren't the way we want them to be, when we don't feel at home in the world, when there's that place of discomfort, how can you remain rooted in the love and affirmation of God so that you can seek the good of the worlds where you are without ever belonging to it? You know, Jesus was able to do this because he... He heard and lived out of that, that message, you are my child whom I love, and you I am well pleased. That gave him the, that stability to be able to, to live and love without ever giving in to kind of belonging to the world. This is not an easy thing to do. There's always this pull to, 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 to let go of that affirmation to get what we think what we need to try and get what we need from the world around us. We're going to see in the stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel that it's hard for them. It's risky for them. But if we're to live well as exiles, this is the, this is the call, to, to live from that place of identity and security in Christ. And from there, you don't need to chase it from the powers of the world. You don't need to chase it from the informal or formal people who control things around us. From that place of security, we can love and serve with courage and integrity. That's the challenge. That's the invitation. I hope that you'll engage with this series as we, as we go ahead. Maybe you could read Daniel. You can go back and read Daniel chapter 1 and maybe get ahead by reading Daniel chapter 2. Um, I would also recommend there's, there's a... a some stuff online called The Bible Project, where they walk through outlines of, of books. And The Bible Project video on Daniel is really, really good to help understand kind of the whole picture of the book. And the other thing I've done, and I'm going to do it for this series and see how it goes, is I've created a blog post where all I've done is put the text of Daniel chapter 1. But there's comments open, and you can go onto the blog and share some thoughts, and then share some thoughts about the text, about the sermon, some questions, respond to each other, and just try and create a space for kind of community conversation around the chapters as we go. So if you want to find that, it's covenantchurch.ca slash blog, and you can click on the right one and, and, and engage there. Um, I leave those questions with, with you to, to think about and consider, see where God might be leading you. Let me pray, and then Brent is going to come and lead us in a closing song. God, like the exiles, I wish that things were the way they were supposed to be, the way you created them to be. I confess that I too easily and too often give way to uh, living in ways that aren't in line with Jesus. And I thank you for your grace for us on this journey as we learn what it, what it means to live as exiles and what it looks like for us to live in the Jesus way in a world that doesn't have Jesus as Lord. As we wrestle with this series, God, I just um, pray that you would lead us Guide us, stir our hearts both individually and collectively so that we can do this well in a way that, that puts you on display, that seeks the good of this, the, this place to which you have called us and that genuinely shows your love, even in the face of those who 
rejects, reject it and rejects us in the process. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to finish with one song here. Um, I welcome you to stand or sit. I'm just waiting for my iPad to work. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, yeah, let's let's sing together. We're going to finish with a song called Lord, I Need You. And let's just sing that together as, as a prayer. Lord, I come have a couple of reminders before uh, we send you out today. Um, the new cover, there's a newcomer's lunch. Uh, stick around downstairs if you are planning to stay for that. Um, to contribute financially, uh, you can either go on our website, click on give, or there's a box at the back where you can, um, you can give. And our prayer room just over here will be open with Elise after the service today. So uh, let's pray. Um, God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for um, the fact that you're with us, and God, that um, we just pray that you you help us in this journey 
with you um, that sometimes isn't easy, but is is real and it's meaningful, God. Um, Father, we just pray for your guidance as we go throughout today. Um, we pray for relationship, for connection. Remind us to do that as we go throughout our week, just to seek your face. So thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace.